Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are uh, going to get started. My name is Neela Richardson. I'm chief economist of the payroll company ADP. And this issue is long in the making, right? The uh, concept that market wages may not pay workers enough to afford the necessities, like housing, like education, like health insurance, didn't start with the pandemic. But the pandemic has made it worse, right? Uh, the cost of living crisis that is around the globe in many advanced economies means that everything has gone up in price, particularly housing. And the great news, the silver lining this year, is that we all, most of us here at the forum, expect inflation to moderate. But the funny thing about that moderation is prices won't go down. They just grow more slowly. So this is a continual issue that companies have to face. Fortunately for all of us that we have a distinguished panel to discuss the issues and the trends and what they're seeing works and doesn't work when it comes to living wages. So let me introduce them to you now. First, uh, to, my, to my left is Minister Huberis Heil, who is the uh, Secretary of Labor in Germany, so welcome and thank you for sharing your experience in raising the minimum wage last year in Germany. I think that will be a very welcomed addition to our conversation. Also joining us is Professor Stephanie Stancheva from Harvard University. Stephanie's research explores uh, people's sentiment towards public policy. Uh, and so again, as this is a policy change, that research comes in handy with a discussion of living wages. Uh, to her left is uh, Mr. Dennis Denis yep. <laughs> Macuel, who is CEO of ADECO. ADECO operates in 60 countries as a staffing agency, so he has a lot to tell us about the corporate response to living wages. And no discussion is complete on living wages without having uh, Chris, Christy Hoffman present, I believe, uh, with unis. That is the global union representing 20 million members in 150 countries. So please join me in welcoming our panel. So the concept of a living wage probably varies in every room that it's discussed. But it's very much linked to the World Economic Forum conception of what a good work framework is. And you'll see this PowerPoint to my right. And the first point in that PowerPoint is the promotion of fairness on wages and technology. Um, and if technology is part of this discussion, I would welcome it. But let's focus on fairness in wages. And I think to kick us off, we can turn to the professor. And Professor, if you could kind of give us an overview about this concept of fairness tied to public policy and how people perceive what a living wage is. Great. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I can give you a little bit of the research perspective here uh, based on research we do at my lab at Harvard, the Social Economics Lab. Uh, I'll try to talk very fast, but please interrupt me if I, if I go too long. Um, so the first, the first thing is that, to me, the living wage is actually part of a much broader issue, which is that of good jobs. Uh, a lack of good jobs is one of the key issues we're facing right now, uh, which are driven by two secular trends, globalization and technological change, and which are really hollowing out the middle class and standard of living. Um, and you can see this in labor market polarization, in regional inequality, decline in job stability, increase in insecurity. And it creates this rift between people who can benefit from globalization and technological change, typically you know, digital elites in metropolitan areas, and those that are left behind. And the costs of that lack of good jobs, you know, they're broad and they're really enormous and require new, new policy thinking uh, in coordination between businesses and governments. So what are good jobs to people and what do people think is fair? So one of the things we do at the Social Economics Lab is to do large-scale surveys to really get into people's minds and understand how do they think and reason about economic and social policies. And what comes out as fair to people is, you know, a good job is a job that will definitely provide a decent standard of living, a living wage. But it goes beyond that. Uh, people, you know, want effort to be rewarded. They want some level of personal autonomy, some stability and security, uh, and some scope for career progression. And 
many people think that their job is not as good as that of their parents at the same age, uh, and that good jobs are not available to them where they live. And the costs of that lack of good jobs, of course, they're direct labor market costs on the workers affected, but it goes way beyond that. Um, you know, what research shows is that there's social costs in terms of breakdown of families and social capital, um, drug use, opioid use, uh, crime. Also political costs, a rise in polarization, a rise in populism, um, and ethnocentric nationalistic tendencies. So the costs are really broad and really big if you know, nothing is done against this. And what, what this really requires is a coordination between governments and businesses because these costs are not necessarily taken into account by businesses when they choose to not create good jobs or to create good jobs. Um, of course, good, good firms do create good jobs, but typically, to a large extent, this is done for business purposes, not taking into account these broader social, economic, political costs. And this is where government intervention is needed uh, to give the right incentives and to work sort of hand in hand with business. And in terms of you know, what new policies are needed, I mean, perhaps the easiest way is to contrast this with what, what we have done, especially in rich countries over the last you know, decades. The traditional welfare state really relies on two pillars. One is, you could call it pre-production stage, so that's education, training policies to really get people into the labor market. And the other, let's call it redistribution, is transfers for pensions and social insurance for risks like unemployment, um, illness, disability. And largely, focusing on these two makes a lot of sense. Um, and the third pillar, which is the production stage, was really left aside. The production stage um, was very much there to foster productivity, innovation, and growth, but not really thinking about social policies or inequality. And the separation between social economic policies those that reduce inequality and insecurity on the one hand, those that foster productivity, innovation, and growth on the other, makes a lot of sense when good jobs are available to everyone. But it doesn't make a sense today when globalization and technological change are hollowing out the middle. So we really need social policies that look more like the economic productivity innovation policies and vice versa. So we really need to merge the productivity and the inequality agendas together. And just very briefly, um, in terms of concrete policy directions at a very high level, given the lack why, of time. Why don't we pause there oh, sure. in terms of yes. policy directions? Because I would love to bring the other panelists in on the, the, what you, the roadmap Great. that you've laid out here. And it's a, it's a roadmap that leads to, uh, it starts with good jobs and a living wage, and almost an equation between those two, equating those two things, which could be controversial. But it ends with, if it's not done, the social ramifications and the political cost. So we're going to unpack that perspective, starting with you, Minister, on the political ramifications. And the first question I had for you, as you instituted this 15% increase in the minimum wage in Germany last year, was a really simple one. Why now? What was the impetus for that increase? OK, Nila, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, it's a it's a good start for my debate because it's about the political and the economic costs about uh, bad wages. Um, and I'm very happy that on the World Economic Forum we are discussing the social dimension because it's not just a question of respect and stability of democracies. It's also a question of stabilizing economies. And that's very important. Um, in fact, what, what, what is the aim of, of this debate? And I think um, the sentence has to be, if you work all day, you should be able to make a living. It's an easy sentence. It's hardly done, because many workers in global supply chain do not make living wages, or through they often work in a difficult environment and have long working hours. As a matter of fact, industrialized countries benefit from supply chains. So I firmly believe that we have a duty. We must work towards living wages around the world, not just in our country. Um, but how? That's the important question. For example, through our partnerships between de developing countries as part of our developing corporations, and we can promote decent pay. Moreover, we can start and implement joint initiatives at a multilateral level. Global standards are also important. These standards are developed by the International Labour Organization in Geneva and its members. An important example 
uh, of such is the standard of ILO Convention 131. Um, it deals with minimum wages fixing. I plan to ratify this convention in Germany during the last periods. Let me talk about three levels. Uh, in Germany, the, the launching of the minimum wage was heavily discussed about 10 years because we came from a different tradition. We had a tradition of strong social partnership in our so-called social economy, social market economy. And at the beginning of the 90s, before or in the end of the 80s in Germany, the collective bargaining was very strong, over 80, 90 percent for companies and for employers. Um, but it got step by step weaker, especially in, in the service sector. And that's why we launched a regulation for minimum wage in 2015. And I raised in the last year to 12 euro. Why 12 euro? Because in the European debate, and we have now a European directive for the member states, uh, the idea is that a living minimum wage should be 60% of the medium income of an economy. And 12 euro in Germany is 60% of a medium. Uh, uh, but let me add two other ideas. A minimum wage is still a minimum wage, is a minimum wage. And I think we have to talk about strengthening, once again, collective bargaining. Because it's not the duty of the state to set wages. It's a question of how we can deal between workers and companies, and trade unions, and association of companies. Um, and that's not just important for the question um, of wage setting. It's also important for the dealing of transformation because the state is not able to, the policy makers are not able to make micro um, uh, decisions. And so we are talking about in Germany not just raising the minimum wage. Uh, by the way, it's strengthening our uh, demand uh, in our uh, economy. It's also about strengthening collective bargaining once again. One example is that we will pass a law that um, public spending uh, for uh, companies who will work for the state um, have to pay um, the, the wage of collective bargaining uh, treaties. Uh, uh, not a race to the bottom, uh, but race uh, a little bit higher. Second idea, it's not just about minimum wages and collective bargaining, it's also about reskilling and upskilling. Because, as you mentioned, there's a deep, deep transition driven by uh, decarbonization, driven by digital change, driven by demography. Germany, we are not too old at the workforce, but a little bit too young. Um, we have the highest rate of employment we ever had in Germany, and we have a lack of skilled workers. Uh, that's a, a threat for our growth in the future. And that's why we're passing a reskilling and upskilling strategy. And um, there has to be measures in the companies and even by the states to become a reskilling and upskilling nation. This is our aim because this is a question of dignity that people can work and have a living wage. This is a question of respect and democracy, but it's also an economic necessity to have a skilled labor force to be competitive in the future. This is our idea to re-strengthen social economy. And last point is because you mentioned the current situation of the crisis of the pandemic and also um, the crisis driven by the U Russians' war against Ukraine. The funny thing is that our labor market is very stable. In fact, we used a little public money for short-time work schemes and it helped to stabilize our economy, our labor market. There is no tsunami on the German labor market. But in fact, the inflation is a threat for a lot of people. And that's why we need step-by-step -step strengthening collective bargaining to find a fair uh, wage uh, and to have stable societies as good economic uh, views. 
But once again, coming to the first point, it's not just a debate for a nation, it's not just a debate for a, a European Union. Um, I think it's time to discuss this on a global level because we are talking about supply chains. And I'm deeply convinced in this time where globalization has to be free and not decoupling, we have to find a fairer way of globalization and we have to care. Companies and states have to care about supply chains because uh, the current situation shows us that supply chains can break. And my thesis is that fair supply chains with fair wages in other parts of the world are more stable than the other ones. Yeah. And that's why we are passing also a law in Germany for due diligence for companies in global supply chains. And we're also talking about a European framework for due diligence law. It's not just um, um, the, um, uh, the old fashion we should, but we have to, I think. This is lessons learned of the crisis and it's necessary for the future. That's great. Minister, uh, you introduced a, a few topics into the conversation that I want to pick up on before quickly before turning it over to Christy to pick up where you left off on collective bargaining and differences around the world. But the first that resonated with me, and I, I think with the audience as well, is that governments have a responsibility not just to their citizens to advocate for living wages, that governments like Germany, yeah. like the US, have an obligation to express advocacy for living wages worldwide. And I think that's an important point in terms of globalization. Um, the second, um, kind of, yeah. I, I want to ask you a quick question on yeah. this. Um, you've, you've given us a number, and as an economist, I love it. Yeah. You've given us a data point. You said 60% of the minim, median wage is the right number. Yeah. Okay, we'll have to pressure test that a little bit, right? But is that the minimum wage that Germany has now, or is that achievable for Germany in the future? No, 12 euro is, was a political setting, but it's, it's nearly 60% of the medium uh, wage in Germany. In the future, not the state will raise the minimum wage, but a commission joined with, uh, with trade unions and uh, company associations. But the funny thing is when I talk to my American colleague, Marty Walsh, who's a great guy. Right. I know, um, I know, and Secretary uh, Walsh. Well. Uh, yeah. Former uh, mayor of Boston, mm -hmm. uh, um, Democrat, and I think the United States are a good example that the question of dignity and respect for people who, um, who drive an economy, and in the times of pandemic we call them heroes mm -hmm. uh, of today and for all days, and they get applause. Um, it's a question also about respect. And three years or four years I traveled to the United States, I visited my former colleague in the USA in the Trump government, and I uh, went uh, to Detroit, and I want to learn a little bit about why workers vote for Donald Trump. That's as a, for a German Social Democrat, an interesting question. Why people are voting for a president who steal their health, health insurance? And one, the question is, is there respect for labor? And I think the Biden administration and uh, Marty Walsh has learned this lesson. That's why they have an uh, initiative called Empower to tr strengthening collective bargaining in the United States. And that's why there is a debate on raising the minimum wage. In, in, in the European debate, 60%, not of the average, but of the medium of the uh, income, right. is, is the benchmark of the European directive. It passed. Uh, how we do it in the national economies is the res responsibility of the member states because even in Europe there are different traditions of collective bargaining. There is a strong collective bargaining in Sweden. There's weaker one in Eastern Europe and the South of Europe. Germany is, like always, a little bit in the center, <laughs> in the middle. Uh, but everybody has to find a way in Europe in the future first to um, find a way for a minimum wage, 60% of the minimum uh, of the medium uh, income, and secondly, to strengthen so social partnership of and collective, collective bargaining. bargaining. That, that's by law. Right. Well, that is a great introduction to Christy, who I think you have a 
a very holistic view of collective bargaining and the challenges and opportunities within countries and in between them. So if you could address that question. Thanks, and it's an honor to follow the minister <laughs> with his comments about the importance of collective bargaining. But I just wanted to back up a minute with the cause of the working poor, because when you look at these very rich countries of the OECD, the US in particular, has a very high percentage of workers who are, in fact, poor while holding down a job, even often a full-time job. So how could this happen? And one of the, I think you, you've pointed out earlier, globalization and technology. I would add a third, which is really a sustained attack across the West, where there have been unions in the past, and, and there are still are in some countries, a sustained attack on the institutions of collective bargaining and on support for collective bargaining. And I think that's paid off in terms of higher inequality in those countries, which have weaker institutions around bargaining. And when I say that, it's not only the possibility to achieve a bargaining relationship, which is very hard in some countries. I would even argue in most countries of the world, it's very hard. But then it's also not having uh, the bar a possibility of bargaining across a sector. And when we look at living wages in, most of the, in much of the um, value chain, we talk about these outsourced industries. If we just look at garment production, for example, where you have millions of workers, four million workers in Bangladesh um, producing garments, um, they need a sectoral living wage because, you know, to negotiate one factory at a time, we need these, we need these structures and these institutions that actually produce, you know, make that possible. And often that's illegal, let alone, you know, facilitated. I think that's an important role that government can play to help bring the, the especially again, when I, when I think about this outsourced and the globalization, the produce, production, not only of products, but also, let's say, call, call centers where there's millions of workers in the Philippines or, or uh, security guards and cleaners and so on. So the sectoral part is really important. Um, but collective bargaining on, on its own has been proven. So many studies came out during the pandemic, just before just, and during, to talk about the value of collective bargaining and creating more sustainable economies and reducing inequality, more stability um, you know, in terms of industrial relations um, and how important it is. It also raises standards. And when you get to the question of what is a, a living wage, um, I think you know the European Union has chosen to benchmark it against other wages in the country, which isn't really about is this enough to live on with dignity. It is like you should at least be making half of what most other people make. You know, I think it's. I would argue. I mean, I appreciate. I think it's great work that they've done this, and it's also linked to collective bargaining in the sense that, as at least as I understand it, if seventy percent or more of your workers are covered by a collective bargaining agreement, you don't have to have a minimum wage. So that's actually like an opt-out, which gives an incentive to um, have bargaining. And I think that's an important one, because in bargaining, it's not only about wages. It is about upskilling. It is about benefits. It is about paid time off and scheduling and so on. And these are choices that we think the workers should have involvement in making some of those are trade-offs. It's not only about wages. Um, and so when we look at the metrics for living wages, and there's lots of academics, you know, and we look at those and say, you know, I mean, I trust that they're well done and so on, but, but you know, you'd, you'd rather have the workers and the, and the employers together negotiating what they think is a living wage and a, and a wage with dignity, which includes some of these other things that might not be captured within the wage alone. So I could go on quite a bit on this, but I'll, I'll stop there. But where you ended is a really important point, which is the flexibility of that definition to change as a result of the bargaining relationship between employers and workers. And so the other participant in that relationship is represented by Denny. Uh, could you explain to us uh, how your, your company has tackle the concept of living wage, particularly when wages are rising in many parts of the world and the benefits that you see? Yeah, well, <clears throat> first, I think uh, usually when you talk about wages, uh, we talk about the cost to the company, mm -hmm. right? And, and we get it wrong. I think our, our accounting standards drive us to this, but it's crazy today to you know, account for people as costs in the PL and not an, as assets in the balance sheet, right? So I think our accounting standards 
uh, are driving us in the wrong direction. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, you know, it's critical for companies. I mean, the, the challenges of our world will be solved by people. And investing in people, and not only at, at top leaders, uh, but, but also at all levels of the organization up to the front line is critical. To your benefits that you were asking for, Nella, is of course we know that when people are financially secure, uh, they demonstrate more resilience. Uh, their mental health, which is a plague today after COVID, mental health is a big plague in, in the workforce. Uh, you know, their mental health is better. Um, you get more engaged uh, people, and more engaged means more productive, uh, better loyalty, lower turnover, and I think a better reputation for companies. Um, so, yes, there are benefits. Now, you know, you talked about collective bargaining. I think it's we have to take a sectorial approach to that. There is no, uh, you know, simple answer to the question. We also have to take into account that companies are part of an ecosystem. They have clients and they have suppliers. Mm -hmm. And de depending upon where you sit in the supply chain, you may feel an economic pressure within, you know, from your clients, from you know, the competitive uh, landscape, uh, which doesn't make easy. If you're a small and medium business, it's, you don't have necessarily the same uh, negotiating power than large companies. So, there's no ideal landscape uh, that tells us that, yeah, you, 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 uh, you, you uh, raise the wages uh, to, a, to a living level, which is still questionable. What is a living wage? Right. You know, minimum wage, for sure, depending upon the countries, doesn't allow people to have a decent and fair life. Let's be clear. So going over that is probably necessary. But uh, collective bargaining agreements are critical to achieve at least, you know, through social dialogue, um, a level that, that people can feel comfortable with. But we have to be very conscious uh, along the supply chain that, uh, you know, the end client has a big responsibility mm -hmm. and not pushing down, you know, a great uh, position in, I'm going to pay all my people living wage and then now look at how down the chain, how people are paid. The outsourcing component. Yeah. Very critical. Do you want to add on to that, Christy? I do, because I, I, I meant to say that in my remarks. But I think that there isn't a free lunch, so to speak. I mean, that if you, as a company, want all the workers in your supply chain to have a living wage, you also have to pay a little more. I mean. There's been so many studies done about the living wage in the garment sector, and if the workers producing the T-shirts that we wear earned a living wage, what would that cost per T-shirt? Well, maybe it's 10 cents, or maybe it's uh, you know a little more than that, but it's not very much indeed, and it can't all just set, be pushed onto the consumer. I think companies have to really... Um, this has been a big pr project of our sister global union, Industrial Global Union, with a, a project called ACT, where the companies have agreed that all of the brands, the big brands, that the producers will pay a living wage, but that this will be part of a sectoral bargaining and that the companies have to change some of their practices in terms of payment. Um, and that's the toughest part because it's not free. And I think, you know, where the clients are saying we want the our direct employees to get a living wage, no problem, but then when it comes to the ones at the very bottom of the chain, that is where the heaviest lift often takes place. And um, so I, yeah. yeah. So I wanna get back to this concept of fairness then, because there are trade-offs, and oftentimes it's the consumer who ultimately will pay the cost of those trade-offs. And the idea that living wages are variable, and even within a country, um, my background is in labor and housing, Housing is a huge part of the consumer budget. And there is a housing shortage in most advanced countries. And the price of housing is extremely high, making it afford unattainable to have uh, a home uh, of good quality on a minimum wage salary. So when you think about fairness, whether it's geographically or what components, not just wages alone, lead to fairness, where does that lead you in your research? 
Yeah, no, these are great questions. Um, and it, it speaks back to these much broader costs of not paying a living wage that, uh, that follow. Um, and Minister Howell is very right to also mention the, the economic costs, which are not just on the labor market. For instance, innovation remains bottled up in like the best companies in a sense and never trickles down mm -hmm. through the creation of more sort of jobs in the middle of the skill distribution. So it's also a huge efficiency cost that is there from those. And what I meant to say hearing, um, hearing these amazing comments and really great ideas is the business rationale is there, but it will only get us so far because of what we call spillovers, externalities, which are there uh, and which a business cannot and, you know, should not be expected to necessarily take into account, you know, the costs of housing, um, all the other fairness concerns. And this is where policy really has to step in. Um, and the approach shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be the sort of old, perhaps top-down prescriptive approach, but rather a much more collaborative, iterative one with businesses. Um, and I think the sort of key policy areas, which are also the ones that we actually proposed in a, in a report commissioned by Emmanuel Macron mm -hmm. in France was one, active labor market policies, which are in conjunction with employers, with this quid pro quo. Like, employers need a qualified, trained workforce, but society needs good jobs provided in exchange. Um, the other is business and regional policies that are specifically conditional on creation of good jobs. Third is innovation policies, which are not just labor uh, destroying, in a sense, as it's often the case, but actually incentivize labor augmenting, labor friendly innovations. And the fourth, which um, Christy alluded to, uh, and also uh, the, other, the other presenters as well, is international standards, actually, on trade policy, for instance, which may sound a bit strange initially, but you know, something has to be done against this almost social dumping that kind of brings down social labor dumping. and social standards in, in, you know, in, in some countries. Um, and we have examples of that. The World Trade Organization puts many standards in place. So it's only a step away to think of also imposing some labor and social standards. Um, so these are sort of the big, I think, policy areas uh, that can be addressed. I think social dumping has Mr. Hiles name written on it in terms of no, your no, introductory no. comments about <laughs> the role of, of, of countries globally uh, to be supportive of living wages. Um, not, not the social dumping part, but the actual reverse of that to, to really increase social standards. Um, I want to I want to stick with you for that, and I also want to to ask you about these other components of mm -hmm. the living wage structure, um, like skilling and reskilling. Because the fact is, there are jobs mm -hmm. you can call them bad jobs, as the antithesis of the good jobs that people need to do. We need people to do these jobs, mm -hmm. bad jobs. And there was a time where. Um, immigration into the US, the, the pathway to the jobs market was in bad jobs that led to social mobility over time. Maybe not in the current generation, but hopefully in the second generation. Those bad jobs provided a pathway to citizenship. So as we're talking about reskilling and scaling upwards for the jobs of tomorrow that can embrace technology, what about the jobs that we still need as a society to do? And how do we make sure that we have the wages that can support living? a good standard of life. Let, let me be very frank and outspoken. Nobody on this panel, and I'm very thankful for this debate, is naive. Um, it's about the old-fashioned way. It's about profit, it's about wages, and it's about productivity. And the question is, what is sustainable productivity? And if you have the view on, on short-term profits, it will be very good for a short term. But I give you an example. After the German reunification 30 years ago, we said Germany, well, Eastern Germany is a new part of the social market economy of the Federal Republic of Germany, needs some years to be more productive, and then the wages, we can raise it regionally to the West German level. In fact, this period was too long. And the effect was that the skilled young labor force left East Germany. And now they have a problem to find them. We have investments by Elon Musk and by Infineon. First industrial big investments in, in the last years. And they need skilled labor force. So once again, it's not just a question of respect and justice. 
the question about profit and productivity. Second, um, I, I think I'm, I'm a, not just a fan, and I agree that, that collective bargaining is more than wages. It's about strategies for, for reskilling and upskilling. But even the states have to do some homeworks and some things. One is we have something like an upskilling national strategy with the social partners, and we will change some laws. There's an Austrian example we want to copy for Germany. Uh, it's called education time. The idea is if um, employers and employees um, agree that people can have one year to reskill or two years in part-time, and uh, the German labor insurance will pay 67% or 60% um, for the people because you need time and you need money um, for the time for, for reskilling and upskilling. Second idea is to, to uh, support uh, especially small-sized companies. If they invest in, um, in reskilling and upskilling, we can support them. It's the idea of a leverage for investment. Um, we also have the idea of a network, regional networks of uh, small-sized companies and bigger ones for reskilling and upskilling. In fact, we have to be very, very uh, clear with a view on several sectors. And in fact, you, you used the word bad jobs. Yeah, I, I did that provocative. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm provoked. <laughs> there is no bad legal job. There are bad circumstances, bad wages. <coughs> and we have to talk about the question, and I think this is lessons learned from the corona pandemic once again, that these people working in these hard jobs are keeping our society and our economy alive. Right. And because of this, we don't have to just have a talk about this. We have to have respect. And reskilling and upskilling is not just about reskilling everyone to an academic. It's also about uh, uh, vocational training. And it's not t t telling anybody, excuse me, to become a magister, professor, whatever. Um, but it's about the question how to, to secure your employability because of the new necessities. And it's about chances. Last but not least, um, it's once again about productivity. And the biggest problem I mentioned in Germany on this question is not the industrial base. The big industrial companies in Germany, like in my home region, Volkswagen, have strong collective bargaining, strong worker council, there's checks and balances for negotiation. Um, male jobs in the industry is not our problem. Service sector, mm -hmm. female jobs is our issue. We're talking about healthcare, we're talking about care jobs, talking about um, cleaning jobs. If we go today in our hotels, back here in Davos, who cleaned our chamber? Right. And what is our respect for them? To give them five euros or dollars as a tip or as a right? And this is very important, especially for companies which have, which have a demographic problem. Last but not least, um, it's also about skilled migration. This is a necessity for our country, uh, additional to reskilling and upskilling and to, to rising the, 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 the female uh, um, participation in, in work in Germany and uh, to be healthy, as you mentioned, even physically help healthy to the retire time. It's also about demographic uh, changes. We need skilled migration. And the question is how, 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 how to deal with fair wages because nobody will come to my country if there are not fair wages for them. <laughs> and, and to amplify your point of, of the number of people making minimum or less in the United States, there's double the percentage of women as there are for men. So this is a gender equity issue living wages as well, and part of living wages is affordable childcare, 
We know that the care economy was decimated during the pandemic, so you see the spiral. But I want to get to the cost, Denise, because um, there is a sense that if you lower the bottom, you see this wage compression between your bottom paid, low, lower paid employees, your middle paid, your upper paid. Um, does raising the wages at the bottom of your pay distribution at all affect the medium and top pay earners? Um, and what are the costs? If you could walk us through the, what that looks like for you in terms of your workforce. Well, is there a knock-on effect of, of improving, uh, yeah, the, the, the wages at the lower uh, level of the pyramid? Yes, progressively. I, I don't think it's massive. Um, and, uh, but, but again, if we consider people as cost and not as assets, we get it wrong. I know that the accounting standards are driving us to that, but it's a, it's a, wrong, um, it's a wrong aspect. And I just want to, to highlight one thing because we don't have much time, but uh, uh, you know, we are entering into, or more or less, we are in a recession. And it seems for the moment that it's a job full recession. And if companies do not think about people as, as assets and uh, invest uh, and go into, into the pattern of higher, fire, higher, fire, right, which has been a cr traditional pattern, they will enter into trouble. I think it's time. We don't, nobody knows how deep the recession is and how long it's going to be. And it's different from countries. But we really have, and, and it, it's all a question of wages, right? If you, if you see wages as an investment and you see people as an investment, that you have to consider uh, you know, the way you manage your negotiations in a different way. And, and I think because we are entering into troubled waters, uh, I would urge companies to be, to be very mindful about how they adjust their workforce and keep the talent and redeploy the talent. You were talking about upskilling and reskilling. It's, we know talent scarcity is there. And redeploying talent, even with a higher, when you have higher wages, you, you, you are, in a way, incentivized into ensuring that they are productive. So you put them into better jobs, and maybe you automatize what you talked about, the, the sort of so-called bad jobs. So as we wrap up what I think has been a very compelling conversation, I think there is an agreement on the panel that collective bargaining is part of the solution. Um, I would like for you to all give me very briefly, because we have two minutes and 20 seconds and counting Excuse left, um, your, your thoughts about what is the one other thing other than collective bargaining that the global community can help do to help ensure that we keep our eye on the ball of living wages and that we adjust it appropriately for inflation. It's not a one and done concept. So starting with you, Christy, what's, what's your second solution? The one solution? other thing besides collective bargaining, I, I think there's a lot of things we could do to support collective bargaining. I think that, that might uh, there be should place. be, minimum wages should be living wages. I think that that's a big gap that we see in many countries. If when you look at the US minimum wage of $7, a minimum wage is closer to 20, right. the living wage. So right. that, that is one, one, one important thing, is that governments should establish minimum wages that are, that are living wages. Um, and um, um, I, and I, I think this supply chain uh, attention is really important. I think that, and as Denise says, somebody has to pay in the end, but, but um, the supply chain attention is where we see so many crises. And lastly, and I know I should only say one thing, but I do want to come back. This is a, an issue of women's equality. It's an issue for immigrants. Yeah. The cleaners, the caregivers are almost all women and immigrants, and there's no reason for those jobs to be bad jobs. They can be the first job on your ladder to mobility, but don't have to be bad jobs. And I'm proud to say in, in Switzerland, and where I live in the other part, at least they did raise the wages for care, uh, for care workers, low wage care workers, nursing home workers, uh, to 25 uh, francs an hour. And so, that has spillover effects for other women in working families. It does. Denny, if you could quickly give us your... your I, would, I would subscribe to everything that you said, Christy, and I would just add that, particularly on the living wage, I think there's still a, still a fuzzy notion that we, have a, we don't have a clear definition, and having a clear definition of that would, would certainly help uh, you know, give a direction 
uh, for, for companies for the prepared negotiations. And, you know, the definition is also linked to where you live. Living wage in London yeah. is very different from Correct. living wage in Manchester or Leeds. Mm -hmm. So that's something that would help uh, guide the discussions, I think. Exactly. Professor, your research, how would you amplify that discussion on solutions? Yes, I think in addition to collective bargaining, it's these sort of key policies at the national level uh, in terms of active labor market policies, innovation policy, and then industrial policies in a different way, not necessarily the old way. But at an international level, I think it's really the discussion around uh, labor and social standards to avoid this race to the bottom that is, that is happening. And then finally, Mr. Minister Heil. Yes, talking about the global level, I think it's about fair treat agreements. It's about due diligence and not just corporate social responsibility and global mm -hmm. supply chains. That's why we have a national law and we will become have we will have a European law. But last year we hosted the G7 presidency, and there was in the declaration the word binding rules on that. And I'm very happy that this debate is moving forward. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for your comments. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank